So I think you have some questions for me. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so my first question, what inspired you to pick up the trumpet? Well, you know, I uh, grew up in a neighborhood in New Orleans uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with. It's the Seventh Ward. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's the old Seventh Ward, not the new <laughs> South Seventh Ward, as they call it, uh, which is basically on the other side of uh, St. Claude Avenue, uh, adjacent to the Bywater. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in an area closer to City Park, and uh, I started uh, taking music and band uh, at St. Leo the Great Elementary School. And this would have been in 1968 uh, when I was 10 years old. Uh, now, I had a uh, desire to play music before that time. Uh, my first, the first instrument I actually put my hands on was a guitar that mm -hmm. my, my parents bought for me. Now, my parents were not musicians, but they loved music. So uh, growing up in my household, I'm the eldest of four. Uh, wow. There was always music being played on the stereo, on, on the on, on the. Uh, jukebox and uh, my parents had LPs, uh, even some 78s uh, uh, and of course 45 RPMs that I think a lot of young, really young people wouldn't know what that looks like uh, since we, we're in this digital age now. Uh, so uh, I, I began to, well first of all my parents rented a coronet for me uh, uh, because at the advice of uh, the band director uh, at that time at St. Leo was a, a nun. It was a Catholic school, a parochial school. I went to Sister Mary Hillary, who was a trumpet master. And of course she played uh, uh, various other instruments being a music uh, educated, education major. Uh, and she uh, advised them to rent a horn just in case I decided after a few weeks that that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Uh, but I took to it right away and I began to take private lessons first from her. And within the first three months, I began to develop an embouchure. And uh, she noticed that I had a very good ear, uh, as well as I was, of course, learning uh, uh, music formally, then learning to read and going through those method books that I'm sure you have gone through and, and mm -hmm. anybody starting an instrument to bell in methods and, and so forth and on into getting into the Arvin method book mm -hmm. and some of the other me method books like Salzburg, et cetera. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but I always love to uh, embellish on <laughs> written melodies and so forth, uh, which eventually I got the nickname jazz when I, by the time I got to high school. But um, uh, Sister Hillary saw that I had a, a good ear uh, in comparison to most of the other kids that were my age at that time. And, uh, so after three months, uh, my, my folks invested in a new horn for me. They saw that I was practicing every day diligently. Uh, they couldn't get me away from the horn. And uh, uh, I loved it so much. Um, and I still do, of course, after now 53 years of playing. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, eventually I started playing in the concert band where we were doing uh, symphonic music. Uh, they did not have a marching band at St. Leo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was uh, auditioning for honor bands and with the, the Louisiana Music Educators Association had these, there were contests and uh, you know, competition between kids from various schools in the Archdiocesan music program there. So you got to fraternize with young uh, aspiring musicians from other elementary schools and, and, and then later on from other high schools. And uh, one year, I never forget, I, she asked me to play baritone horn. I had been playing the trumpet now for two years and uh, I, I went for it, but I dreaded it. The fact that <laughs> the, the case was so, so much larger than my, my trumpet case, my coronet case. And I walked to school, it was about maybe three quarters of a mile. And I, I, that was my only beef with it. I enjoyed playing the instrument, picked it up. And uh, she, she also, uh, uh, she forced me, she didn't really have to force me, but she, she, she asked me to read the uh, bass clef part for 
the, the baritone bass clef rather than the baritone and treble clef, which was great because it gave me an early understanding of concert pitch mm -hmm. even before I got to fool with the piano or got to understand the difference between certain transpositions and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that was great. And, uh, and, and, I, and she, she knew this, I think, but she, she made it seem, for me, it, she made it seem like it was so much fun and it was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the only problem I had was <laughs> the size of that instrument uh, being a little fella at the time. And so uh, I, I, I even played it so well that after a year, uh, my second year playing, I auditioned and made a, a concert band, played, played it in a symphonic band, played a baritone one year. Hmm. And then I went back to the trumpet. And then uh, I fooled around with various other instruments uh, my first three to five years of playing. But I always gravitated back towards the trumpet. Uh, there was something about that instrument that uh, I, I loved and I still love so much. Perhaps it had to do with the fact that uh, my first and foremost mentor was Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard his sound before I recognized any other trumpet sound. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and that's probably in part and in whole due to the fact that my, my folks uh, had a few Louis Armstrong albums that were often on the turntable. And uh, Immediately, I, I I wanted to know who that was and grab the LP cover and looking at his picture and and, and reading the liner notes and uh, then seeing him on uh, television appearances and movies and of this back when I was a little boy mm -hmm. and knowing that he was from New Orleans, I felt very proud to play that instrument and. Uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in, I would say that uh, at least two out of six youngsters played in band. So there was a lot of activity musically going on in the neighborhood. Uh, and often we would get together and jam uh, myself and some of the other uh, youngsters who were at different schools. Uh, I, I think I'm the only one in the neighborhood that played an instrument and went to St. Leo the Great. Uh, the other kids uh, basically were going to the public schools in, in the neighborhood at the time, which were very cl close to, to the house. Uh, my parents, uh, I was fortunate that they were able to send me to parochial school where I, I did, I got, in essence, I got a better education at that particular time than uh, the public school system was offering here in New Orleans. And um, so I uh, would jam with my friends and uh, we'd get in the garage. Uh, I lived at, on 1316 St. Dennis Street, uh, which was very close to the St. Bernard housing project, which no longer exists. Uh, after Katrina and the levees failed back in 2005, a lot of things changed in the city of New Orleans, mm -hmm. as you may know if you've, uh, I don't know how long you've been living here now, but, uh, things uh, are a little bit different than they were before the <laughs> Katrina. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was a fellow by the name of Danny Barker who mm -hmm. lived around the corner from my, 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 my house. And uh, Danny, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Danny. Uh, mm -hmm. and one of your instructors, Steve Mazikowski knows him very well. And uh, Danny uh, was a member of the Fairview Baptist Church at the time. Uh, and the church happened to be just on the corner from my house. And Danny lived about two blocks around the corner from my house. And often I would see him pass by in his vehicle and, you know, very slowly with his window down and listening to us, and listening to me practice. <laughs> and, and so one day he, he came up and he approached uh, the garage the garage door was up and he approached me and a couple of the other fellas uh, who were jamming together there and uh, asked if we were interested in becoming a part of, uh, of this youth band that he was forming, helping his pastor form for the church. And uh, of course I said, yes, I said, if it's okay with my parents, uh, I'll be delighted to do that. And uh, uh the band that he <laughs> formed and that his pastor uh, asked him to organize eventually became known as the Fairview Baptist Church Marching Band. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was 
at that time in 1970, it was uh, the only brass band uh, consisting of young musicians under the age of 18 playing mm -hmm traditional brass band music. Uh, and uh, it was, you could say, uh, a renaissance of the brass band uh, uh, awareness in the city of New Orleans. And uh, before I get carried away and keep going on and on, I need to slow down because some questions you still may have that are, I'm answering some later questions that you have, but I, I'm going to slow it down a bit so that you can get your questions in and I make sure I don't get ahead of myself, okay? <laughs> So, uh, so I, that would have been uh, my, I, I would have been, have been playing the trumpet for three years uh, at that time when I started performing uh, with Danny Barker's group, the Fairview Band. Wow. That actually brings me perfectly to my next question. Um, I wanted to ask you, what, what did you learn from Danny Barker? What I learned from Danny Barker uh, was twofold. Uh, it was uh, how to be a professional musician. And of course, uh, I learned things about uh, jazz that I didn't know uh, of, uh, uh, it from a musical standpoint. Uh, uh, he, by him playing the guitar, playing the rhythm instrument, a harmonic instrument, uh, uh, at a very early age, I got to hear uh, chord progressions and things that he would do with the tunes, the tunes that we, play, we were playing. And basically the songs that we were playing were, were hymns from the church. Uh, those were uh, the first type of songs that I began to understand the form to and, and be able to improvise uh, uh, along uh, the chord progressions of tunes like When the Saints Go Marching In, uh, and other spirituals like In the Sweet By and By, and Nearer My God to Thee, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Uh, those were the type of songs we were playing. And, and, and also we would play, uh, I got to understand the 12 bar blues uh, form at that time, being uh, 12 years old and uh, with songs such as Joe Avery's blues or Joe Avery's piece, better known as Second Line. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 another song that's a blues uh, in, in a different key from Joe Avery's, we used to play in concert B-flat. And then uh, there was uh, uh, Johnny Casimir's whooping blues, which is an E-flat. So we got to play, uh, you know, uh, young musicians getting to play some blues and different keys. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Often Danny would even bring in uh, other instrumentalists to give us pointers uh, on improvisation and, and phrasing. Uh, uh, cats like uh, Earl Turbington, uh, who was a uh, great alto saxophonist, the late Earl Turbington. Uh, another gentleman by the name of Joe Garden, who was a great clarinetist, jazz clarinetist from New York City, who moved to New Orleans to uh, playing down there, and he had been working with Danny quite often in New York during the time when Danny lived there. I guess that would have been uh, in the mid-1930s through almost the beginning of 1960s, because Danny moved back with uh, his wife, Blue Lou, uh, to New Orleans in the early to mid-60s. And, and that was during that time when, of course, I met him, uh, mm -hmm. which was the late 60s. Basically, I knew I, I, I used to see him often in the neighborhood, but I didn't know he was a, a musician and I didn't know who he was. Uh, but later I found out. Wow. Um, that must have been amazing. Uh, it, it, it was. And, uh, you know, at this, when, I, when I reflect on those things, uh, uh, when I, re I realized how special it was for me and for my colleagues, uh, and just the neighborhood itself, uh, it, it, it did something for the neighborhood. The whole purpose of the band, basically, the purpose of the band was to keep youngsters off the streets in my neighborhood. And I mean, it was the city, there was, got to remember when I, when I was a teenager and a young boy, there was still a middle class. So mm -hmm. that was basically a middle class neighborhood, of course. We were in an area near the St. Bernard Project, housing project, which was, of course, subsidized uh, housing for, for folks who couldn't afford to own their own, have, a, have their own uh, home, et cetera. 
And, uh, but the things that there was not, it was not like as dangerous as it is now, as it can be in some of the suburbs of New Orleans, mm -hmm. you know, and I often tell people many times that, you know, New Orleans is, it's dangerous, but it's livable. There are other cities. Uh, I've been to many cities around the world and I've been warned in places, say not to go here, not to go there. You, you have to know where you, where you are, where you're going. And I think uh, it's just by unfortunate fate, if you end up in a situation where you lose your life or someone comes up and hurts you, harms you to rob you. And I've, I've never had anything like that happen to me or my brother or my sisters as long as we lived in the city of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and very few friends that I know, close friends and musicians and friends that uh, I've been associated with, uh, they have, have never said that they have felt afraid to, to be in the city of New Orleans. But in that neighborhood during that time, that's what the pastor wanted to, uh, to do is to those youngsters who didn't have the same uh, direction as someone like myself with parents who were working class parents and who were uh, who cared about the children and made sure that we were in when the street lights came on and, mm -hmm. and that you went to bed and you weren't hanging out on the corner uh, with bad company and of course the, in the neighborhood where during that time where the neighbors knew who you were and mm -hmm. your parents knew who their children were and so if you got into Look like you were getting into something that you shouldn't be getting into, they would step up and say something. That, or either they're on the phone, you get home, and your mom or your dad's on the phone, usually your mom's on the phone talking to one of the neighbors and say, Miss So and so, I saw your son, blah, blah, blah. So, so that's that that eliminated the possibilities of getting yourself into something uh, that you shouldn't be getting into. And so that's the way it was uh, for us and for, for me. In, in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, who who are, are your biggest influences as a trumpet player? Um, um, uh, probably my biggest influences, uh, they, they start with Louis Armstrong and uh, later I uh, had the opportunity to listen to uh, recordings of Shorty Rogers, who uh, uh, I had one of my inf early influences also was Hugh Masekela, uh, mm -hmm. the South African trumpeter. And and th the reasoning for that with those guys, they were popular at the time. Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, mm -hmm. uh, they were popular. It wasn't like, I, I think I would have been uh, more uh, familiar with uh, bebop trumpeters in that particular genre of music if my parents were musicians and uh, mm -hmm. they they knew what i should have been listening to i mean they didn't you know of course i got so much from my teachers but then when you're in a household where your your pair either one or both your parents are musicians especially jazz musicians being in new orleans then you have an opportunity i think to be exposed to uh, other other things, uh, mm -hmm. musically speaking, and so later on, I, I did uh, I, I discovered uh, the likes of of Freddie Hubbard, Clifford Brown, mm -hmm. and Blue Mitchell uh, was one of my favorites. Uh, if we're speaking of trumpet players, uh, I also have a fondness for Clark Terry, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I do play a bit of flugelhorn, and I I I, I often desire to have a distinct articulation like he has on, mm -hmm. the, on the flugel and the trumpet as well. But I think that of, of, of all the uh, cats who have manipulated the flugel horn, Clark Terry stands out uh, as having such a very profoundly unique sound on that mm -hmm. instrument. Uh, and <laughs> uh, I don't know, maybe before I die, uh, get close to having to just be able to, as they say, spit the watermelon seeds like he does mm -hmm. there and, and, and they have such a silky smooth tone. Um, and uh, there are, you know, there are lots of, uh, of the up and coming, the young musicians who 
continue to inspire me that I, that I hear and I say, whoa, cats, you know, Nicholas Payton, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, Nicholas, I, I, I worked with his dad. Uh, we worked together when his dad was alive. Walter Payton, his bass player, was also a music educator. And uh, I remember Nicholas when he was eight years old. And I used to go to his dad's house for rehearsals. And uh, this was before he really started playing the trumpet. And uh, his mother played piano as well. So he was in a musical household. But... Uh, it was uh, so uh, astounding to me when I heard him uh, as a teenager, and he started playing, and and of course, and and now it's just I'm I'm continually inspired by cats like him, uh, as far as being, uh, if I must say, a complete musician and trumpet player. And not only is he playing jazz, but he's playing other musical genres as well, and quite proficiently. And mm -hmm. needless to say, the type of multi-instrumentalist he is, uh, you know, he's the type of cat that he can think he needs to be on the bandstand. He can do it all, all the instruments quite proficiently by himself. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, I must say, if we're speaking of trumpet players and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so, so inspired by his, what he does. And uh, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing. They are, and there are others uh, I could go on a long, a long list of others, but I'm going to stop right there because we're going to we'll run out of time. <laughs> um, can you talk about the specific role of the trumpet in New Orleans music? Um, yeah, uh, in New Orleans music, it's, uh, particularly in traditional jazz, the trumpet's role is. Uh, basically to play the melody and the lead. Uh, usually in a, a, a traditional jazz setup, uh, the instrumentation can consist of trumpet, trombone, clarinet, or trumpet, trombone, saxophone, or you have a saxophonist that doubles on clarinet. And of course, piano, bass, drums, or either guitar, bass, and drums. Sometimes you have a tuba instead of a, a, a acoustic bass or fender bass, uh, or in, in it, it depends on the situation and the venue you're playing in. Uh, and uh, when within the ensemble, uh, when the, the ensemble parts are being played, it is, uh, it is imperative that the trumpet player pretty much sticks to the melody. And of course, there's allowances to embellish on the melody, wherefore it's if, if you play the song three or four times a night, it's slightly different uh, than it is from the first time or the second time mm -hmm. that, that you played it. At least that's what you, you should aspire to do. And I try to do that. And, but yet the arrangement depends on you keeping a certain form if, if there is an arrangement, of course. And usually uh, with that sort of uh, band that, where there's collective improvisation uh, and uh, no written charts in front of you, then you, and if, 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 if cats have been working together all the time, it, it almost seems to be music that is on a sheet in front of them because they all, they all know what they're supposed to do. The clarinet is playing the counter harmonies right where they should be. The trombone is, as they say in New Orleans, tailgating and playing a, a, another harmony uh, and, and doing things, some counterpoint to the melody uh, that makes it all sound like it's orchestrated and it's just music that's off the top of everyone's head. Uh, uh, I, the trumpet, uh, its role in the traditional setup is to be in the lead position and set the the mode for the other horns and and basically for the the uh, the the rest of the ensemble. So there's some clear definition as to when you get in and when you get out. So uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the song, uh, uh, it's important that the trumpet player plays something that is definitive, that where everyone can hear that they're going out, uh, mm -hmm. even if it's not discussed verbally. 
but musically everyone's listening and they know that he's going out. Maybe it's it's, it's just simply uh, taking the last cross up an octave, mm -hmm. uh, implicating a, a lead in tone to a tag, if there's going to be one at the end. And uh, those are things that are essential to uh, uh, being uh, the trumpet lead in the traditional New Orleans setup. And uh, usually it works pretty well. And I think that uh, when the more, ex the more experienced uh, players uh, have that thing where it works almost like second nature mm -hmm. and uh, people have often uh, come in and they've said to me, for example, I've been doing it for a long time. So they'll come up and say, well, uh, you know, uh, how did you, these are musicians, young musicians will come up and say, how did you know uh, when <laughs> you were supposed to come in after the drum solo? Or, uh, how does everyone else know that you're uh, going to take the song out? And in a word, uh, listening, <laughs> everyone's listening to each other. And um, I think that uh, it's a, that's the beauty and magic of, of, of playing New Orleans traditional jazz. Uh, playing jazz in, in general, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, traditional jazz, but usually that type of setup with three horns or more, uh, someone, and usually it's the trumpet player, has to take the role as the lead uh, lead voice in the ensemble. Hmm. Um, how, how would you say that you developed your unique sound on the horn? Um, well, uh, I would say that I probably developed my unique sound on the horn from listening to other instruments uh, mm -hmm. for uh, ideas and inspiration uh, and trying to emulate those instruments as well as, well, first of all, trying to emulate what they were playing, the lines, uh, you know, or uh, just a certain tone of nuances. Uh, uh, saxophonists, Dave and Danny Barker, when we were coming up, he often would say, you know, get some Charlie Parker records. So later mm -hmm. I got some Charlie Parker records to listen to Charlie Parker and try to play like that. Uh, uh, I found uh, most difficult for me was trying to uh, <laughs> play some of the lines that John Coltrane played, which seems like it just didn't fit well with my instrument as well as just trying to understand the, the the language that he's using is a different dialect. For for me, I'm, uh, I I I found I found it very very challenging and fascinating. Something that I I never really could get myself into following. So I chose to go more along. I guess you could say the traditional realms in uh, listening to uh, the more, if you would. A soulful jazz players, uh, uh, Sonny Stitt, Gene Ammons, you know, Charlie Parker, uh, uh, you know, contemporary artists like Wilton Felder, who I came up listening to a lot of the jazz crusaders and mm -hmm. listening to Joe Sample's uh, lines that he played on, that he played on the piano and uh, listening to uh, uh, pianists, uh, some of my famous, uh, favorite bebop pianists like Winton Kelly, uh, uh, listening to the lines that uh, Horace Silver plays, uh, mm -hmm. and, and listening to Bud Powell, uh, Phineas Newborn Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found myself gravitating toward that particular uh, vernacular than the, than the more, I guess you could say, even avant-garde to, if, it, if you more uh, extremely modern uh, approach to to improvisation. Uh, for me, I think uh, I, my style is grounded in, first of all, grounded in my background in brass band music as far as being a jazz musician and being able to play music that people respond to uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they dance to or it makes them feel good. Something that someone who is not a musician uh, feels something some stimulation from the music where they don't find it to be boring or uh, maybe they don't find it to be something that uh, 
uh, that's uh, an, an, an intellectual experience, uh, something that's more that they feel in, in, in their hearts and spirits from, from what I play. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm saying this probably because that's what I, I feel when I listen to recordings of those musicians that I, that I named uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, I think that uh, music in general, it, in general, it serves a, a, that, that purpose uh, for people. Uh, it's, it's like medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you tell me about your process for learning a new song? Well, when I'm learning a new song, uh, first of all, I usually, uh, I usually, uh, if if it's a, if it's a song that already has a melodic line, then I I make myself very familiar with the melody, and then afterwards I'll uh, get into looking at the chords and their relations to one another and trying to really uh, understand how the harmony, how the harmony works. Uh, Cause usually uh, a lot of songs you find uh, a song is in a song. And uh, mm -hmm. like, for example, playing New Orleans traditional numbers, I learned over the years that I could learn uh, quite a few songs after learning one, but when, you know, there may be slight differences in, in where the chord changes go from one to the other. And somewhere they are exactly the same chord progression, but a, just a different melody line on top. And you find yourself uh, learning much more that way, where you see the relationship between one song's uh, chord progression and another. So you got a melodic line for, for example, say let's take a traditional tune like Bourbon Street Parade. Mm -hmm. And then when you think about that, you, you have also another song you can play and possibly, but in a different key, would be like Bill Bailey, mm -hmm. Won't You Please Come Home. And then uh, you look at it again and you have a tune from the drummer Paul Barberin, you know, Paul Barberin second line, a totally different line on top, but uh, pretty much the chord structure and the form is, is the same. And uh, I, I, I usually use that as a way to learn from getting from learning one tune to the next. And then uh, usually if I, you know, if I'm really stuck, then I, I'll sit at the, the piano and slowly <laughs> my feeble fingers and try to play some, some of the, uh, sit down and play the chords so that I can hear just the colors of the, of the harmony to help me when I'm improvising, to help me un be able to play something, hopefully something different each time I approach the tune uh, in, to improvise on. Uh, and now what's really, what's really hip is that I'll use, uh, you know, either Band in the Box or iReal Pro or one of those and put some chords in. If I don't have musicians uh, available that I can get with where I can play uh, mm -hmm. and, and we can play together, which is the best thing I think is getting together and being able to to play together, and 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 work out some things. I'll put one of those in, and that way I can I can play and then play it back and just just have the chords and listen and play along. Try to uh, to compose really basically creating different ideas and embellishing on the uh, uh, embellishing on the the, the melodies. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, uh, for those songs that are uh, pretty straightforward and they have a, a definitive uh, melodic line that, uh, I, put it this way, I think that uh, for me, like it, when I listen to someone like Clifford Brown play the trumpet and improvise, no matter how far he is away from playing the exact melody, you can still hum and hear the melody in all of the lines that he's playing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the type of uh, player as, as far as improvisation goes that I, I, I desire to be where, where you can hear, still hear the song uh, as an old uh, 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 musician once told me uh, by the name of June Gardner, a drummer said, just play the song. <laughs> and uh, he didn't mean necessarily play in your solo to just play the melody, but just play play the song that 
something that has to do with song. I think that that's uh, that's my uh, my my approach to 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 playing and improv- improvising on on a piece of music. Hmm. That's great advice. Um, I have a, a another trumpet question for you. Can you can you tell me about your warm up routine on the trumpet? <laughs> Well, well, um, my warm up. Uh, I remember when it would often take me anywhere from thirty minutes to forty five minutes before I felt comfortable in the mouthpiece, mm-hmm. and that was I, I would say that was during my first uh, four or five years. Well, I would say even my first ten years of playing, uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't feel really warmed up until after. Uh, uh, almost an, an, an hour into playing. And uh, later I, from being uh, on hand for clinics and, and w- witnessing other, watching other trumpet players play and asking the questions. Uh, I worked with Wallace Davenport. He, he delayed Wallace Davenport uh, for a while and he <clears throat> was well into his seventies. And, and w- what always fascinated me was the way he, could play and and it looked like he was playing with so much ease. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and also uh, uh, a, a, a trumpeter by the name of William Fielder, who was an educator uh, and basically was uh, one of the trumpet teachers at Rutgers University. Well, often he would make he would do tours and come down to different schools in, in Louisiana. And one. One time he came to St. Aug, St. Augustine High School, which is where I was, and he was friends with our band director, uh, Edwin Hampton, and he did a, a two and a half hour clinic there and, and talked about breathing and, and air movement to, to the instrument. And, and was at, I was 16 years old, and it was a time when, you know, I needed that then. It, it, even at that time, it had not fully set in exactly. I didn't fully understand what he what he meant by getting pointed into the mouthpiece and mm-hmm. and and using your air and using your diaphragm, the squatting on your diaphragm, and and um, uh, you know, my instruction early on was not from so much technical. Uh, aspect as it was from just learning how to read music and learning the met from a method book. I hadn't, I hadn't until that time had anyone really show me that the the basic principles of of blowing uh, a brass instrument. And so with that, it it, it came to me by the time I was 20 years old, it happened. And I realized uh, that, and there was a, a guy, Dale Roberts, Robinson was his name. He's, he's, he's deceased now, but he was from Chicago and he died very young. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, but he played the instrument without minimum pressure. I would say not non-pressure because non-pressure, you, you really can't project without any, having any pressure. You have to use some comp- pressure and just lip compression and not uh, taking shallow breaths to, to get air moving. So uh, he, he was talking about that. And, and then I understood more what we were saying. He was the first guy that I would see buzzing, uh, that I actually saw buzzing without having a mouthpiece mm-hmm. on his lips. And I remember back in all day, say, what's warm up? You keep just buzzing on the mouthpiece, but he wouldn't put the mouthpiece. You don't, I don't, I'm not putting my uh, instrument to my face until after I've gotten the blood moving in my face. So I usually just, uh, if I'm driving to a gig or walking to a gig, or if I'm uh, getting ready to sit in the, in the back uh, stage waiting, before I actually go to horn, I'll just sit here and... <laughs> And just do that in a couple of the highest point, and that sounds like it's it's in the upper register. But if you place the horn there, it's 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 all below. It's all low C or below because there's no pressure, no 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 pressure on the lips at all. Mm-hmm. But I find that if whenever I do that, and if I remember to do it, which I, <laughs> uh, occasionally I've been rushed and forget and just forget to, to do it probably, and then I'm disgusted for a while. 
before I feel comfortable. If I do that for anywhere from three minutes to four to five minutes uh, before I actually have to play, I'm feeling pretty comfortable in the mouthpiece uh, after the first chorus of a song. I feel like I'm, I feel comfortable. My flexibility feels good. Um, my tone feels good. And uh, of course, mind you, that's not if you're sitting in the outside area and your horn is ice cold, cause, you know, because it's like affecting your intonation and everything. You got to go inside and play. And in New Orleans, that can happen sometimes, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't get so cold. But if you're sitting in the preservation hall in the back and then you come in your horn's been sitting on the on the horn stand they don't have heating in the room and you grab it and <laughs> you didn't push the tuning slide in all the way before you feel that you're not so sharp from being from the instrument being so flat from the instrument being so cold so uh other than that you can come in and put the horn up to your face and feel really comfortable in the mouthpiece uh, from simply buzzing your lips uh before actually putting the metal to your face. So that's uh, that's the warm-up technique that I have religiously tried to stick with now for over the past 25, 30 years now. Wow. Um, I actually just have one more question. Um, I just wanted to ask, what what is some advice that you'd give to young musicians and just anything else that you want to talk about? Well, advice that I would give to young musicians today uh, is to remember that music serves a purpose. And if you're a musician, uh, you are like a preacher or a doctor because there are people who are out there in the listening audience who come to hear you perform, uh, they're coming to get something that they can walk away with that makes them feel good inside. Mm -hmm. And um, I recall, I never forget a story uh, that I'd like to quickly say about a lady that would come to New Orleans every year from France. Uh, she'd come for the festival French Quarter Festival and Jazz Festival, but then she would stay often a couple of weeks afterwards. So she'd be in town for a month, six weeks, and uh, alone. She loved she loved jazz. She, I was playing at a, a club called the Pat Up Lounge, which was on Bourbon Street, and back in uh, the early 1980s, this would have been, and it was myself. Lucian Barberin was the mm -hmm. trombonist. And a pianist by the name of Edward Frank was on piano. A young Shannon Powell was on drums. And a bassist by the name of Richard Payne. Uh, Richard and Ed, and of course, just recently, Lucian, uh, are no longer with us mm -hmm. in, in this realm. But we had a very, very nice quintet and uh, playing traditional jazz. And that lady would come and listen to us every evening. And she told me that Jazz is her dope, and, and she, and she, she said this is this is her dope, and uh, and she would sit the whole night and have uh, her her cocktail, and at the time smoking was still allowed, <laughs> cigarettes in the in the uh, clubs, and uh, and and I I I I really understood what she meant, and, and when she said that, and uh, I think that. Oftentimes, uh, as musicians, we have to remember that uh, uh, the, the people who are supporting us, we have to be of service to them. Uh, and I don't think that we would have a purpose if it were not for uh, the listening audience, for people coming. And one thing is playing music uh, for musicians and for your peers and so forth. And that, that's great. And and getting together and do things. If you're going to make a living as a musician, I think that you have to understand the purpose uh, of of your vocation, and that is to 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 bring joy to to people with your your music. Uh, I I think about an interview uh, I saw of Louis Armstrong once uh, <clears throat> in British TV, and I think he was over there touring in the fifties with his all star band. And the interviewer asked, asked Louis Armstrong 
is his music. Mr. Armstrong is your music, folk music. And Louis, for a couple of seconds, he thought and he said, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. It's music for folks. Uh, and, and so, I mean, that just sums it all up. You know, the music is for, for people uh, to, uh, I've heard music be defined as healing. Uh, I think music is healing. It's spiritual. Uh, it's powerful that it, it moves. It 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 can. Uh, I think of all the art forms, music can generate uh, uh, the the visual thing. Uh, if even with your eyes closed and hearing, it, you can bring back, make you think of something that has like a certain smell. You know, it's mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you remember something and from a certain scent of a perfume or a flower or something that brings you back 40 years or brings you back 10 years and say, wow, that reminds me of something, you know, and music does that same thing. Uh, I mean, one thing is visual art does, has that ability too, I think, but I think that music has the ability to do it all, to bring those, mm -hmm. those emotions and feelings and, and, and experiences back to not just the musicians, but to the people who are listening. And uh, I, I think that uh, that's that's an important thing for us to remember, uh, young musicians and old old musicians like myself. As I get older, uh, 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 but uh, the and but the music, I, I, I really believe that music keeps you young, keeps you feeling young, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, I feel, uh, and I think that all the young musicians out there should know that uh, to keep themselves motivated to play because uh, it, it's 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 even it's healing for yourself. It's it's good for you too, not just listening thing. It's in it's music. It's uh, not sounding selfish, but it's good for you to uh, to to stay motivated if you can and to play. Uh, I still practice diligently. Uh, after 53 years of playing and often they say once you're over 35 or something 40 if you're playing if you're not gigging you don't pick up your instrument uh unless you're in a situation where you have to be writing music for someone or or you're doing you know it, and if you if you do it for your living then you're going to play but then there are times when you don't have gigs so uh the important thing is for you to remember even if you're not working uh you have to Keep yourself in a motivated, motivated position, uh, a, a good frame of mind for, for picking up the instrument and playing, uh, even if you're not getting any any money for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I can imagine that for a lot of musicians, young musicians, older musicians alike, that it's been really tough the past year with this pandemic. Uh, I know it has been for me. Mm -hmm. uh, difficult to keep myself motivated uh, and uh, I haven't had any work since March last year. Uh, I've had a few things that I've done. I mean, this is a, a very nice thing to do here for you, not only just doing this with you and for you, uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's something where I can reciprocate something that helps mm -hmm. a lot. And, uh, uh, you know, I've had a uh, Fortunately, uh, the Preservation Hall Foundation has been very helpful to myself and other musicians who are part of that specific collective. Uh, the, and, and, and the funding that they have provided for a lot of the musicians uh, from donors, from people who love music. The, as I was saying, the, the people who we need to remember uh, mm -hmm. why we're, we're here, why, why we're playing. Uh, and they have they have a love for the music and for the musicians. And so they, they look out for us too. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that as uh, musicians, we, we need to remember that we have to uh, think about uh, our audience and the people who are coming out to support us. Uh, I think it's, 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 we serve no purpose if we have no one to play for. <laughs> Well, I think that's about all I have um, prepared, but thank you so much for your time. Um, it's oh, been great it's, to talk with you. It's, it's my pleasure. And I'm, I'm, I regret we had to meet virtually like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I get back, uh, I'm here with my, my family, my wife and our little ones. And when we get back, 
uh, I'll have to come and hear you play live and um, maybe, uh, you know, I, send me a, I sent you a Facebook request, you, you know, and uh, I'll be listening and checking your, your your page more often, even more. I'm on Instagram too. And if, mm -hmm. you know, you're posting things, I want to check it out. And, you know, if you see some stuff I have, you know, check it out and, uh, you know, I hope we can maybe get to play together even when, when I'm back in New Orleans, if you're still going to be there. Yeah, and, I would uh, love that. <laughs> you know, so let's, let's count on doing that. And, and I hope that you and uh, yours are safe and, and continue to feel well and, and that we can get beyond this pandemic because it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, we've, I think everyone's had enough of it. Yeah. Okay, Emily. And, um, you know, uh, enjoy that nice. I know the weather's nice there now. I wish I was home. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and uh, it's not bad here in Helsinki. Today is a sunny day, but it's still almost freezing. But this is this is the Northland, you know. But it's it's been lovely. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. I hope to talk to you again soon. Likewise. Okay. All thank right. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.